So we're going to have a little fun with uh, trade-off analysis today. Um, and as I started thinking about it as a journey, how we were getting into trade-off analysis and, and the process that we went, we went through, I'm going to start you all the way back in 1998. Um, Joe left out the part that I have been with the department for 25 years. I started when I was 10. Um, <laughs> So uh, in 1998, some of you were probably in elementary school, um, but we're, we're going to start way back at 1998, which was 15 years ago. Um, so that's where, where we're going to start the basis of this, and I want to go back even just a little bit further. Now, they're going to have to help me. I am most of the time technology challenged. Okay, here we go. Um, how many of you have ever seen the movie Vacation? Chevy Chase. All right. Good. Okay. I was in fear that I was going to get up here and nobody was going to know what in the world I was talking about. But if you're ever thinking about a road trip, this is the ultimate in road trip movies. Um, you know, Clark and the Griswolds, something happens to them all the time. The movie was released in 1983. So how many of you watched it in 1983? Okay. A little fewer hands, but still a pretty good number. So I'm... I'm not over the average age of this group quite yet. All right, that gets you in the frame of mind for what we're going to talk about. Um, so first, this is kind of where we're going to go today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about NCDOT. We are not the largest transportation system in the country. Texas has this beat by a couple hundred miles. Yeah, so uh, I was at a, a meeting last week in San Diego and Texas wasn't there, so I got to claim the big rights. But uh, we're going to talk about NCDOT. We're going to go to Wally World, and we're going to plan our journey, and we're going to load that truckster, and we're going to talk about all the stuff on the road. Um, we're going to look through the gate to trade-off analysis, um, and then we'll wrap it all up. But to talk to you a little bit about North Carolina, how many of you have been to North Carolina? My North Carolina posse's on the front row. Okay. You've been to my fair state, my fair adopted state. I'm actually from... Uh, Virginia married the boy next door while I was at NC State and decided to stay. Um, but North Carolina is a broad state on this screen. Um, we are mileage wise, or a, well, we're neck and neck with Texas mileage wise. Area wise, we're maybe half to a third of Texas, so we're not there yet. Uh, we have 49,000 square miles, uh, nine and a half million dollars in, or a million people. In population, we have three major universities in North Carolina. You heard the Go Wolfpack crowd. That is the main engineering school. Ah, we're not counting that one. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, Duke and UNC all in the research triangle. Uh, Carrie Clemens is our token ECU, East Carolina University. But we have a lot of schools. We have a lot of things going on. Um, I'm a big hockey fan. We have the uh, once upon a time Stanley Cup champions, Hurricanes, uh, the Panthers, lots of stuff going on. So we are a very vast state in what all we do. And we have to have a big road network to get all those people to all those places. Uh, if you just look at the interstates and U.S. routes in our state, we have about 6,700 miles. If you add our North Carolina routes, we have about 15,000 miles. The big thing that separates us from a lot of other states is we don't have a county road system. Actually, those are all state-maintained roads. So the only other system out there is a municipal system. Um, and if you look on this map, the blue areas, this is water. That is Fort Bragg. And then the, the few blue spots in the mountains are national parks. So we really maintain roads all over the state. Um, give you an idea of the size of our system, 79,000 miles. 170,000 paved lane miles. We have a pretty decent unpaved system anymore. Uh, we have structures, and because we are such a varied state, we have really large bridge decks. Um, North Carolina is our organization, a little bit about our organization. We are divided into 14 divisions or districts. Uh, Texas has 25, so they've got us twice. Um, a, a typical division, this is Division 5, that's the cutout, that's where Raleigh is, that's the uh, capital. But a typical division will have about 600 employees. 
in a division. They have, we have bridge yards, we have bituminous units that do chip seals, uh, we have roadside environmental, we have county maintenance offices that actually do maintenance work, although we do outsource a good bit of our, our operations. Uh, we have construction offices in those divisions as well as equipment shops to maintain all of our own equipment and we have some design groups and some business functions as well. Supporting those divisions, while they're responsible for maintenance, construction, and operations, we support them with an asset management division. Um, asset management, the main asset management units are the first four. State road management, that is my group, uh, pavement management, structure management, fleet and materials management are all the the true asset management units, and then M&T, construction, and roadside environmental, they're more of our construction TIP side of the house. But the job of all of our units is to assist the chief engineer's office in the oversight of all our statewide programs, as well as be technical support to those 14 highway divisions. So that's where we fall in the organization, and it'll make more sense as to, to how all of these management systems work as we go. So that's about us. We're going to go to Wally World. Um, just like Clark, we had to have a vision. And in 1998, when we started this vision and started this road, Steve Barnado actually worked for NCDOT. Um, Jim Edgerton had not been retired too long from NCDOT, but uh, we had Lacey Love and several others that had a vision for where we were. Um, they, want, they knew where we wanted to go. They had a vision for asset management. We needed to know how to get there. They had a general idea of how we were going to go. Uh, the communication plan was a little bit lacking because you know, we're trying to get started, trying to get everybody off of square one. So 1998, that vision was unconstrained funding. You heard Carlos say that there's all these pots of federal money. Well, we have that on the state side, too. You can spend preservation money on this, but you can't spend it on that. You can do different pieces of the function, but you've got to use different monies to do it. Uh, so we wanted some more unconstrained funding. We wanted credibility with our legislature and credibility with our leadership. We turn over every four years. We have to train new people every time. We wanted credibility with these folks. We wanted to shift from reactive to proactive maintenance operations. Uh, we didn't have a really good idea of what the condition of our system was, so we wanted to be able to do that. We had annual maintenance plans, but they were basically pull out the printout from last year and change a few numbers and turn it back in again. So it really wasn't a maintenance plan that meant anything to anybody. And we wanted to promote you know, effective use of all our resources because you heard Carlos say we're not going to get a lot more resources. Uh, where were we? We were using legacy-based systems. We were tracking everything in spreadsheets. When I came to the State Road Maintenance Unit, we had fellows that were proficient in spreadsheets that would have four or five tabs. They not only had the electronic spreadsheets, they had the old bank book. You remember those old ledger books? They had those old books and they were tracking stuff in there as well. Um, accountability and monitoring were really missing. We really didn't have any planning. We were just running out and doing things and running out and doing this. And we really didn't have a good idea of the condition of the system. So just like Clark had to plan his journey and if you remember the movie, he was going to go to St. Louis. He wanted to go see the world's largest ball of twine. Uh, they were going to Coolidge, Kansas, because that's where family lived. Uh, they were going to the Grand Canyon, and they were going to Wally World. And as he says here, why aren't we flying? Because getting there is half the fun. Um, Ellen didn't believe that. Uh, the kids didn't believe that. They had a little hard time with that idea. So we had some attitudes going on. But uh, they were going to go on this journey. Excuse me, my fingers are sticking there. Well, we had a journey too. We had a planned timeline. We had started in 1998 with our condition assessment program. We knew we wanted a maintenance management system. We put out an RFP. Uh, we knew some vendors were out there that did that kind of work, so we started that process. We knew once we got MMS, we wanted to do it on a handheld device to go out to the field. Uh, those were the days that we really didn't have these great little iPhones that have everything on them. Uh, and we knew we wanted a new payment management system. Again, it was legacy-based as well. Um, but right out of the gate, just like Clark, right out of the garage, we started having problems. We had these attitudes 
that didn't want to come along. I have listed a few of the attitudes, and I brought one of our IT people with us, and David, at this point, I put out a disclaimer that none of this is directed at you. <laughs> We're not throwing darts at David. Um, but we had leadership issues. We had middle management buy-in. We had all these people at the top of the organization that said, yes, this is a really great thing. But maybe the next level was a little more skeptical. You know, what are you doing? Why, we, we've always done it like this. We're happy right here where we are. Don't, don't do this to us. Uh, we had IT issues, you know, IT systems. They don't want to mess up the servers. And what happens if it crashes something? And they didn't want to have any of that. And we, then we had employee acceptance. So in 1998, we passed a new general statute that required us to report the condition of the system to the legislature on a regular basis. And it, we had to report annual routine maintenance costs, annual resurfacing, um, and something called backlog, this really odd thing. Uh, we were working on this. This legislation passed in 1998. We had to have a report to the legislature in December of 1998. We had no idea how to do this. So we did what every good agency does. We plagiarized. We stole Washington State stuff, changed the logo on it, and made it ours. And uh, thank you to Washington State. We got it going. We got that program off the ground and got started. But then we thought things were running smoothly. And then we had a really major glitch. In 2003, we were about to implement maintenance management. And we implemented a financial system right ahead of it. This was a major culture shock. We went from mainframe, black DOS screens, and inputting everything to this Windows-based um, financial system, threw everybody into culture shock. All of a sudden, you're reporting your time and everything on a daily basis, all the way down to the local level. Instead of, put, instead of a clerk putting in your time in the end of two weeks, all of a sudden, we're having to do it on a really, really low level just drove everybody crazy. We had mass retirements, just as this happened. <laughs> um, and nobody was interested in MMS as a result because of all the drama that had happened six months earlier with SAP. Uh, we told them some of the key differences to it, and there's some of the key differences here on the screen. Basically, SAP is just a financial system. Um, it can track all the money that you spend, but it can't tell you where you spend it or how many people you'd put on that section, or um, it can't do inventories or track productivities. It can't do those things. But we just couldn't get over the hurdle of we just implemented this, and now you're going to throw another computer system on us. Well, in 2003, 2004, MMS came online. We got that going. We kept refining our condition assessment program, um, and we were doing more and more sampling. Uh, for those of you who know anything about condition assessment sampling in North Carolina, you know that we sample a lot. Uh, we sample more than anybody else in the country. We sample 23,000 sections of roadway, tenth of a mile section. It takes us a long time to do that amount of samples, but that's what we feel like we need to get the quality of data that we need to a very low level, and I'll, I'll talk about why we do that. Uh, but it, we were starting to ramp up all of these samples, and so people were we really were having some attitudes. We're pushing water uphill. What's in it for me? Why have I got to do all of this? All it's doing is helping those people in Raleigh. And, you know, they don't know anything about reality. They've never been in the field. They don't know what they're doing. But in 2006, this word accountability started coming into play a lot. Um, employees were saying, huh, what do you mean by accountability? Uh, Carlos mentioned performance-based contracting. We actually had a piece of legislation that the legislature told us we could let up to two pilot performance-based contracting projects. Uh, we let one shortly after that, and we'll talk about it. Uh, but we worked in the Charlotte area and let a performance-based contract. But what that did for us was really start to help us refine our performance measures and what we were doing. Um, we had performance measures for our own people, but now we, all of a sudden you've got to rate the contractor and you've got to pay the contractor based on what his rating is. So we really have to have these things right. So we did a lot of work on that. We reviewed our targets. We changed some targets. Uh, we started with something called an infrastructure health index, where we actually rolled together pavement bridge and, and just maintenance operations into one common number. So we started having some mild interest in this whole accountability thing and performance measures, uh, some negativity toward performance-based contracting, even from my own staff sitting in the front row down here. 
Um, where they really didn't, didn't like it, don't, don't know what it's about. Uh, we just got to get this figured out. In 2003, or seven, I'm sorry, we had this swelling tide of accountability. It's the new buzzword. Uh, we had something called a transformation team come in. Am I a slide ahead of myself? That didn't work, did it? There we go. Uh, we have a transformation project happen where we actually had a consultant come in and talk about our organization and talk about what works and what doesn't work and how we could do it better. And we moved all the boxes around on paper and had a great time doing that. We let our first Charlotte performance-based maintenance contract. And we did all of I-85 from, if you know anything about North Carolina, from Charlotte all the way to the South Carolina line and then all of the other interstates in and around Charlotte. So people were starting to get curious about all of this, what was going on. Uh, they were concerned about it. They were also change averse. We've had enough change, stop it. Especially the transformation when we start moving the boxes around on paper. Uh, really started giving people some heartburn because we're sick of change. We're tired of doing it. We don't want to do it anymore. 2008, 2009 brought us a new governor um, and new DOT leadership, yet again, we have a new group. Um, but she also brought in with her government-wide accountability, where our whole state government is now more accountable. We were the leading edge of this. We had, we'd already had some performance measures in place for maintenance. We already were working towards some of these things because of the transformation team. We were already focusing on some of this, so we were held up as the model for the other state agencies. Um, we improved our assessment methods. Yet again, we're always refining those things. Uh, we brought pro, um, pay, payment management system online. So people were really interested on all fronts as to what all this was about. Uh, the old what gets measured gets managed. People started really ma managing more to the performance measures. But we struggled with all the pieces and IT problems kept on keeping us in trouble. Um, a little bit more about our accountability process, and this is going to look a whole lot like Carlos and a lot of his stuff. The, um, the big thing on the top left, NCDOT, we had a mission, vision, and goals. Uh, that has five goals on it. Three of them actually matched with Carlos. Safety, mobility, and we called it last longer instead of preservation. Um, and then there were two on there that were more geared toward DOT, which was a great place to work and a place that works well. Um, those were our five, but same sort of thing. All agencies were doing that. From those goals, we put out a work program, and it's now a 10-year work program, not a five-year work program. But we do project prioritization and all sorts of formulas, and we put out that work program. We have department accountability in the shape of executive performance measures, and we'll talk about those a little more. We have unit accountability. Then we have to go to the divisions and to, my, to our units and put out our own performance measures and our own accountability. And all of that has to flow back in. Uh, we have employee accountability. We'll talk a little bit about our performance appraisal system where we roll employees' performance into these things as well. And then we report all of that back out, and it's just one big circle, how all of the pieces go together. Same thing Utah's doing. Uh, this department accountability, that's what the spreadsheet looks like. Uh, we have these, they're numbered oddly. I can't tell you exactly how many of them are up there, but they're broken into the categories. Safety, mobility, lasts longer, works well, great place to work. Uh, we track those things regularly. If you zoom in on the last longer one, which is the one that most of our management systems feed, we, these are the things that we measure. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm flipping pages up here trying to catch up with you. Um, these are the things that we measure. So you can see from a high level, we really only measure the big stuff. There are much more detailed measures down and in that roll up to here. But for executive level, this is the accounting tool or tool that they use for these things. So those are the, the high level ones. If you roll that down to a business unit, I showed you the divisions and I showed you division five there. This is, was their work plan. Um, they actually now have to, they have to track the goals and they have to go across and come up with the measures that actually fit the goals. So if you're looking at um, SAFER, you're looking at fatality rate 
Well, what are the things that tie to fatality rate to make it better? Uh, shoulders repaired, guardrail, pavement markers, pavement markings. Those are the things that make the roadway safer. Some things that work in last longer or infrastructure help for us. Mowing, brush and tree control, ditches, and those are all the things that we measure in MCAP. So those were all the, the things that we had for them, how they were measured, and then they have to come up with a planned amount. How much of that am I going to do this year? It's taking the outcomes and turning them into outputs. Uh, I told you a little bit about our employees' performance. This is what we did to our, our we had a uh, performance management system, PMS. We turned it into a PDA. These acronyms are driving me crazy. This is a performance dashboard appraisal. Uh, but we took the old PDA with things like uh, provide leadership to ensure safety, um, identify and implement strategies, ensure project delivery, all these things that you play that bingo game with in a staff meeting. That's what our old words were. But we turned them into new more subjective me or objective measures, that our crash rate is between certain numbers, that we have so many pipes cleaned out, that we have so many bridges in good condition. Uh, we started turning it into real things, and I'll tell you, this caused a lot of drama amongst the staff. It's easy to measure Carlos and I and, and higher level managers on these sorts of things, but when you start getting into the down and in, with the guy that's actually patching the pothole, he doesn't care what the crash rate is. He doesn't understand how that ties to what his job is. So we had some trouble with what's an, an output versus an outcome, um, and we've, we've worked with that in the organization as to where's that level that we stop putting crash rate on people's performance and start putting things like how many pipes they cleaned out, how many miles of roadway did they mow. So we've had some trouble with those sorts of things, um, but we're, and we still continue to refine that as well. So all of that was 2008, 2009, keeping us very busy. Uh, 2010 brought new changes. Uh, with the, all of our performance monitoring systems in place, we found ourselves drowning in data. We had more data than we knew what to do with. Um, we couldn't measure all of the things, so we started refining systems. Um, I can roll up more data than you know what to do with, but when you start putting it out there for the public, you overwhelm them, and they don't care anymore. We were trying to be transparent, but not so transparent that we just drowned people in data. Um, our initial Charlotte contract was terminated. We had performance measures that we thought were solid. The contractor bid on them and thought they were solid, but then once we got down to the reality of doing the work, it didn't match up all that well. Uh, we needed to refine our measures. The contractor wanted to walk away, so we, I, at the time I, agree, I called it an amicable divorce, and we walked our separate ways. We revised our contract. To th the big sticking points were mowing and litter. We wanted to track him on the height of the grass and the amount of litter on the ground. And everybody measures those things, right? Yeah. Well. He was having to put more and more money into those things to meet that performance measure, and he actually never did meet the performance measure because we had the level set too high. So the second contract, we actually took those out and made those unit-based. And while I agree that performance-based contracts are a good thing, they're good on some things, but they're really not good on other things. Um, we, so now we have those things pulled out, and we have... We tell this contractor when, when we want him to mow and when we want him to pick up litter. Um, and it's made for a much better contract, um, and it's helped us along the way with some of these things. But we're starting to get, in 2010, we were starting to get more and more uh, positive attitudes, more and more interest from the public. For the first time, we put out a condition assessment report to the legislature that had the numbers going up instead of the numbers going down. And then Lacey retired. So there's no telling what the next person that's going to have to do that report is going to face. But uh, we started putting out good numbers. So people were interested and much more interested in performance. Uh, some of the ways we track performance as an agency. We have these public-facing dashboards, and those are the five, the five things that we track across the top are those five goals. 
So for safer, we track fatality rate. For mobility, we track incident duration. How long is the road closed? Uh, for infrastructure, or for um, last longer, we track that infrastructure health number. A place that works well is the delivery rate on our TIP side. And then a great place to work is this employment, employee engagement. It's a survey that we do. Um, but these are the external forward-facing pages that the general public can get to. If you want to scroll down to a particular county, you can do the other graph at the bottom and you can get down to the county you live in if you want to see where your measures are. For our internal folks, we have some internal management dashboards. Uh, the Griswold's got the behind the scenes tour of Wally World, if you remember. Um, but we have this internal behind the scenes tour as well. Um, these things are only available to internal, intranet people, if you will, on our systems. Um, we track, these, th these are the things that we track on people's PDAs, their individual performance, so they're very curious to go look at them. They're used for detailed data analysis. They're not just the, the high level sorts of things. Um, and we were the first ones in North Carolina state government to use it. And the other agencies were uh, building their, their dashboards off of us. So a couple of these, uh, this is the safer, this is the crash rate. So if I am a division engineer, I can look at my set of counties and say, hey, what's going on in this county? Why is it red? Um, what's, what's going on in, why can't, why have I got a large, for instance, why have I got a large urban area that's green on crash rate and a small rural county right next door to it that's yellow? What's going on? Why have I got that difference? What can I do to affect that difference? Um, and then they track. These are the things that they pull out of MMS. We pull data from MMS every night over to SAP and into the business workplace. So if a division tells me that they're going to plan uh, to do so many shoulder miles of lateral ditches, then they can track what they actually do and then how much they do every quarter. This is a great tool to find bad data because you can put that up there and you can see where we tell them they're measuring shoulder miles and they're, they're reporting in linear feet. You can see the data skew. Yeah. So it has helped us a lot with our data integrity. Uh, I can't tell you that it's easy to fix things in SAP. Once we go back and find the error, we have to fix it in SAP, and I can tell you that that is painful. Uh, but it has been the only way we've been able to get some data, some good quality data, because, you know, garbage in is garbage out. So that's sort of our story, our timeline. Give you the high level, we loaded the truckster. Uh, the Griswolds, if you remember, he bought the truckster to go on the trip. He loaded it all at one time. He loaded it in the garage, and he should have loaded it in the driveway. But he loaded it all at one time. We didn't have the luxury of putting all the luggage on there at once. We had to load it in pieces along the way. Uh, you can see the sort of the timeline and how we did the different parts. We've had a couple of iterations of MMS. We're still working on that field implementation of PMS. We've got BMS just out of the gate. Uh, Trade-off analysis, we're still working on that. We'll talk about that one a little bit more. Um, and then we've had a lot of work with our network data and getting from an old universe file mainframe based system into some of the, the um, geospatial tools. Um, how many of you have HPMS as part of your functions? A few? Okay. Uh, HPMS reporting to the federal government. That's been our big driver to get some of our, our uh, geospatial solutions up there. Uh huh. Oh, okay. 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 SAP is the financial software company. Which golfer do they sponsor? Trivia question. They sponsor a golfer. Who? Okay, Ernie Els. They're 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 big. And some of you have SAP as your financial system too, don't you? A few. Yeah. Yeah. Um, MMS, PMS, and BMS are Agile's products. We have all three of those products. Okay.
So we loaded the truckster. This is not an actual picture from the movie. We decided that this is some parade somewhere, but there's the dog leash and there's Aunt Edna, if you remember that part of the movie. And we're going to talk about that. Um, yeah, we, uh, we had a really good time searching the internet to find the pictures for this presentation. And it was all work related, so we were having a ball. <laughs> Well, while we were on the road, just like the Griswolds, we had all sorts of problems in that 15-year journey that we've been on. We had, uh, we had our cousin Eddie's and our Aunt Edna's and our sibling rivalries. Uh, we had SAP. We had and still have time entry issues and in getting our, our time entered. We've had the always, we've always done it this way, and I'm not going to change. I love doing it this way. Uh, the we've always done it this way, Abishak tried to get me to have my notes on a computer screen up here, and I'm more comfortable with my paper, Abishak, I'm sorry. We've, I've always done it this way. <laughs> we had our distractions. We didn't have Christy Brinkley. We had our own distractions and our own shiny objects. We had our own red Corvettes um, to keep us occupied and busy. We had state IT giving us a fit, running us around in circles, making us jump through all kinds of hoops. Upgrades to systems just when you figure, think you've got it figured out, something changes. Uh, we had real work, you know. It's not all about these management systems. We had real stuff to do. Uh, we had reorganization, which if you don't think that causes drama, that <laughs> causes plenty of drama in an organization. We had network issues. We had server issues. We'll talk about those a little more. Um, just like Clark, we had detours and complications. I don't ever remember the dog wetting on the picnic basket in real life, but maybe we could probably put some of those things in this category. If you ever remember the dog in this movie, you remember that the dog always hated Clark. He always attacked Clark's leg. Clark didn't intentionally leave him tied to the back of the bumper, but he did end up dragging the dog along. Our dog is IT, David, not you. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> Not you, David. We love you, David. <laughs> but you're steadily dragging the IT people. Come on, get off it. Um, all sorts of stuff with the IT folks. Um, a lot of times we felt like Clark. We're never, ever going to get there. We've had enough fun. We don't want to do this anymore. And when I was looking to put this quote on the screen, if you remember it in the movie, I've cleaned it up a lot. <laughs> um, we're 10 hours from the fun park and you want to bail out, well, I'll tell you something. This is no longer a vacation. It's a quest. It's a quest for fun. I'm going to have fun. You're going to have fun. And then it goes on to talk about where there will be whistling zippity doo -dah. <laughs> I've got to be crazy. I'm on a pilgrimage to see a moose. And that's how we felt about it. Praise Marty Moose. Praise all of these IT systems. We're on a quest. We're going to get this done. So it really did drive us crazy. And then we get to the parking lot. We're in the parking lot, but wait, we have problems. Um, just like Clark when he finally got there and found out Wally World was closed. If you remember that, he got there and found out it was closed. We've had our share of moments when we wanted to punch the moose. We're done. Um, we had all kinds of problems. We have had server problems like you would not believe. They just were talking about um, Neil's going to quit crashing our, our system because now we've gotten a new upgrade to some things. So not fast enough, don't have enough, don't do enough, um, all this sort of thing. We've had reconfiguration issues where Agile software won't work inside our security and we've had all sorts of complications with that. Tablets and handhelds and that whole world, Louisiana, we hope you do it for us. Because three times we have tried to buy these things, and three times we have been that close, and IT throws up some new hoop that we have to jump through, and we can't buy them. Um, so we are, um, as an agency, we got tired of it. We just threw our hands up and said we give. Um, as an agency, NCDOT, the construction side of the house is now testing out iPads. Uh, and we have said, y'all do it, have fun, let us know how that turns out. Um, so we're hoping that between Louisiana and our own construction folks, we can get this 
tablet PC thing worked out. IT seems to be a little bit more supportive of the concept right now, so maybe we will get there. Um, we were looking through the gate at what was next. In the movie, if you remember the movie, they get to the theme park, it's closed. They actually took John Candy, the guard, hostage, and they made him take them on the rides. And they rode all the rides. Uh, we haven't quite gotten to take an Agile Assets hostage yet. <laughs> They do have a Raleigh office. We are thinking about it. <laughs> Several of us had lunch with, or breakfast with Steve this morning, and we were telling him, we want this one and that one and that one, and we will accept no substitutes. Steve. <laughs> I let Steve look at my PowerPoint presentation last week, and when he got to this point, he said, you know, you really ought to think about naming the di different Agile Assets modules after different rides in Disney World. <laughs> So Steve, I came up with a really good one for trade-off analysis. It's Space Mountain. <laughs> we're in the dark, we're heading uphill, and we have no idea when we're going to go down. <laughs> well, let's get to trade-off analysis. We'll talk about it a little bit. We have the pavement maintenance and bridge modules of the system now. Uh, we are looking in the gates of trade-off analysis and how to work between those pieces. Uh, we're not, we're exchanging inventory across these systems. Uh, we can pull from one to the other. I can put uh, work accomplished in MMS and it feeds PMS and BMS. I can do those sorts of things. Uh, we hope to one day get to a mobility module and a safety module to feed those other goals and to be able to, like Carlos was talking about, trade off across all of our asset groups. Um, so why are we focusing on trade-off analysis? We're doing that because the individual systems look at their individual networks. Right now, for um, we're running scenarios in PMS and BMS. Well, that's great and all well and good. PMS can run their scenarios, their what-ifs, on the pavement sections, but that has absolutely nothing to do with the bridges. The bridges can run their scenarios based on their bridges, but it doesn't match the pavements. So we're looking to bring all of those pieces together and look at an overall LOS across all of our, our assets to bring up our whole system condition. Uh, these are comparative analysis. This is uh, BMS. So they can run scenario one. They can run scenario two. They can look at, if I spend this amount of money, what does it do to my condition? Uh, similarly, we can run these same kinds of things in PMS and look for optimal solutions in their individual networks. But a lot of times what we end up doing is implementing the blue dot. If we work in just PMS and just BMS, maybe we're not getting the optimal solution. Uh, this is Charles's efficient frontier. Anybody heard that term? Everybody's heard that term. <laughs> Love it, Charles. <laughs> but we em end up implementing not quite the best thing. Uh, so trade-off analysis. The concept behind it is to improve our overall network condition, to integrate all our tools together, to determine an optimal set of projects, and I'll show you how, that, how that's going to work in NCDOT, and come out with needs-based analysis, performance-based budgeting, just like Carlos was talking about, so that we have better assets. We're managing them globally across all of our networks. Um, uh, just to give you an example, for us, uh, NC, or I'm sorry, I-40 in North Carolina runs from the coast through the mountains all the way into Tennessee. It's a big system for us. Uh, use it as an example to show you how this is going to work. Uh, but we want to identify bridge and pavement projects over for a 25-year plan, but then we want to work in a five-year plan. I showed you that five-year work plan rolled now to a 10-year work plan. We want to do those things. These are the main steps. Uh, how does this work? I have no idea. Charles and Abishak and those guys can give you all the down and in details. I'm the high level girl like Carlos. I just want to give you the 50,000 foot view on how this works. Um, those guys can do all of that for you, but those are the steps. And we'll talk about the, the individual steps a little bit. Uh, you define your network. And there again, this is I-40 all the way through North Carolina. Uh, the blue county is Wake County, that's the capital. But on that section of roadway, we, we have 872 lane miles, we have 288 bridges, 
and it crosses through eight of the 14 highway divisions. We're going to use, we, ha we have bridge maintenance scenario analysis running, payment management scenario analysis running. We're going to run a trade-off analysis with the two. We will eventually have MMS in there as well, although that piece is not running for us right now. Um, and we're going to come out with graphs of where are the best solutions. And we can take a graph like this, and we have, to our upper management, our leadership, and shown them that it's, we can get just about the same results for spending $30 million a year as we're going to get for spending, well, for spending $260 million over so many years as spending $320 million. So it's, we're not getting a whole lot more bang for the buck. Carlos talked a little bit about that, too. Um, we're only getting slightly better results, so is it really worth putting all that money in there? Uh, once you run a scenario, it will spit out an optimal work plan. You can see the projects that are there of the 2,000 and some projects that it spits out. You can see where they are in BMS and PMS. And if you look at it in a little more detail, this is Winston-Salem in North Carolina, but if you look across that, you can see where the projects are. You can see the red project is a pavement project, and the blue projects are bridge projects. But those are different years. So does it make sense to maybe put those three projects together all in one fiscal year and get it all done at the same time, reduce your traffic control costs, your mobility co or yeah, mobilization costs, get all those things done in one year rather than tearing up the road and being in the road for two years. And we can also use it to evaluate overall level of service across our network. Um, and then what does it do to pavements and bridges when we start combining projects and moving things around like that? How is it going to affect the overall level of service? And then we reevaluate. We look at those things. Uh, we, the optimal solution, again, had projects in different years. You can look at alternate one, alternate two, alternate three, doing different things and look at it trying to save money and, again, traffic control and mobilization. And then you can graph those things. And you see, you know, you know this, as you move off of, off of op optimal, you see that you have uh, decreasing, decreasing health scores. Um, but you see where the money moves as well. So you learn that optimal is not always optimal, and you need, we still need to have engineering judgment. We still need to, to pay attention to this and look at it and look at how all this works together. So some conclusions. What's my advice on trade-off analysis? Like the Griswolds fly next time? Remember, they flew home. They had so much fun driving that they flew home. Um, but we need to look at this as a journey and not just a destination to get there. Uh, you need to have a vision, have an idea of where you want to go. Those fellows back in 1998, they had a vision of how we, where we needed to go. Um, you have to have patience to get there and persistence to get there. Don't ever give up. Like Clark, drive all the way to the gate. Whether or not the family's happy about it, drive all the way to the gate. Uh, get everyone involved. Bring all of the management groups to, in. Bring them all along with you. Um, even the IT people, David, we bring you along. We brought you with us to Texas. <laughs> um, integrate. Clark had to integrate Cousin Eddie and Aunt Edna and all of these people into the family. We need to integrate and put all of our systems together. But most of all, we got to enjoy the journey to get there. It's family time. It's being with those you love, right? Uh, we have to remember to do that, to bring everybody together and enjoy the journey. So what's our next big adventure? We're thinking Vegas, baby. <laughs> uh, we are going to look at the other Agile tools. We've, they make visits regularly to our offices to talk about what else can they do for us. Uh, we've talked to them about doing the mobility module as part of ours, working on a safety module, uh, some modules that some of you already have that we actually have not bought yet equipment and facilities and some of those other things. We're talking about those parts. Um, but that's where we're headed. 
Uh, so I will meet you in Vegas. <laughs> and with that, Joe, you can have it. <laughs>